I'm very honored to be here today. Thank you to the class of 53 for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, thank you students for hosting me in some of your classrooms this morning. I enjoyed a chance to speak with a few of you more one on one. And I'm very honored and pleased to be here at Darlington. I have a bit of family history here, even beyond my great uncle Sam. My great grandfather, Dee Donaldson, taught science here. So I'm uh, very honored to be part of a tradition of sharing the excitement of science here at Darlington. What I want to talk to you about today is my work with the Mars Rover program at NASA. And I have been part of this program since I was a graduate student. I cut my teeth on the Mars Exploration Rovers um, at Cornell University. And since then, I've been working on the Curiosity Rover, which will be the focus of my talk today. And I'm just now getting started thinking about the next steps of going to Mars with NASA's next rover going in the year 2020. So I'll end with a couple of highlights for that mission and give you a preview of what's to come. But let's go way back in time. This is what Mars looked like for most of human history. For um, most of our existence as a species, this is all we have known about Mars. One dot of light in the sky, slightly redder than the others, slightly brighter than the others, that moved in strange ways that the other stars did not. And so this is most of our experience as human beings with this speck of light that is Mars. And it's really only in the past 100 years, really only the past 50 years of that, that Mars has gone from this point of light to what we know as a full and fascinating world. A hundred years ago, this was the best image that we ever had of the planet Mars. Um, this was taken with one of the largest telescopes on the Earth at the time. And this image really doesn't show you much of anything other than a disk with some darker splotches, some brighter splotches, a white thing at the very top that would be a polar cap. And even 50 years ago, this was the best image that we had of Mars in color, uh, taken with the Mount Wilson Observatory telescopes. And this was the best image that we had of Mars until we sent our spacecraft there. Um, and so it's easy to see how with these images being all we knew about Mars, it was easy for Mars to be a hot topic in science fiction. And the human imagination could run wild. We saw that Mars had dark splotches and brighter splotches, and those splotches seemed to change colors and textures and positions with the seasons. And so people thought that maybe Mars was full of a jungle-like vegetation and full, maybe, of once intelligent beings on the planet. And so this was science fiction, of course. But even in the science world, we thought that Mars was a place that had life, and we took that for granted. I'm going to read from you an excerpt from the, an article in the Talk of the Town in the New Yorker in 1956. And this is going to tell you, uh, to the best of science's ability, what we thought Mars was in the late 1950s. What are the astronomers particularly anxious to observe on Mars this week? Well, there's a green patch that used to be orange. If they get some clear spectrograms of it, they may be able to tell whether it's vegetable or mineral. Furthermore, a cloud formation shaped rather like a W has been seen floating above the canals. How come? Mars has no high mountains, and its deserts are thought to be of rock, not sand. The broad green areas to be observed on Mars were once thought to be seas and maybe mineral deposits, but the best guess is that they consist of prairies of lichens and mosses. Anyhow, they change color with the seasons about as our lichens and mosses do. So this was generally accepted to be true by not just the science fiction community, but by the scientific community, that Mars was a place that had lichens and mosses, forms of life, vegetation that changed with the seasons. And this was taken for granted until we got our spacecraft to Mars, which revealed a much different picture of the surface. This is the first image taken from the surface of Mars by the Viking lander in 1976. And these first landers to Mars didn't show a world that was covered with vegetation. They didn't show any moss, no lichens, no signs of life at all. Instead, what they showed was a battered, scarred moonscape. It looked just like the surface of the moon with these lava rocks that had been busted up by millions of years of impact craters. And this, the only real difference between what this looked like and what the moon looked like was that it had a bit of a reddish tint. 
And so this was um, an immediate disappointment that Mars was not this living world, but that Mars was another dead ball of rock like the moon. Now, this wasn't the end of the story, thankfully. We sent more rovers to Mars, uh, more spacecraft to Mars. The first rover to go to Mars was the uh, Sojourner rover that went on the Pathfinder mission in the late 1990s. And this rover was really a proof of concept that we could drive around on Mars. But even then, um, what this rover found was, again, a barren, desolate landscape, much like the moon. Now, things really changed um, when we started getting high-resolution orbital images. And this was one of the first images taken from orbit around Mars um, that revealed scars carved by liquid water running across the surface. This is an ancient dry river valley, a pattern of channels carved in the surface of Mars that could only have been created by liquid water flowing across the surface. And so this was some of our first evidence that Mars was, in its past, a very different place than it is today. Even though today it was just this dry, dusty, barren moonscape, in its past, Mars must have had water flowing across the surface in order to form some of these large valleys. And even more recently, when I was in college, we started getting images like this from our spacecraft around Mars. The Mars Global Surveyor spacecraft went to Mars in the late 1990s, and when I was in college, this was one of the first images that showed evidence for liquid water that could have been flowing on the surface of Mars more recently. These are small gullies flowing down the wall of an impact crater that are very young, very fresh, geologically speaking. And it was seeing these pictures when I was a college student that made me really think deeply about whether Mars was a place that could have had water on it. And if so, could there have been life on Mars? Could there have been enough water on the planet for long enough that life could have emerged independently from life here on Earth. And if that was true, if life could emerge on our next door neighbor planet, wouldn't that make it more likely that life could emerge on other planets elsewhere in the universe? And if it was more likely for life to emerge on planets throughout the universe, wouldn't it be more likely that at least one of those somewhere would have evolved animal life or intelligent life and wouldn't that mean that maybe we're not alone out here in this big old universe? So this was the kind of deep thinking I got started doing in college, inspired by images like this. And that's what really got me excited about studying Mars, learning as much as I could about the history of Mars, trying to get at that question, ultimately, of are we alone? And in the years since, our understanding of Mars has only continued to grow. Uh, in the early 2000s, some of these very high-resolution pictures from our orbiters on Mars started showing rocks that were very different from the moon rocks. We got glimpses of rocks that had layers on them, sedimentary rocks. There are no sedimentary rocks on the moon. Sedimentary rocks require active geological processes in order to be laid down. The fact that these layers in the rocks existed meant that Mars must have had active hydrological cycles. Mars must have been at once a much more dynamic place than it is today, a much more dynamic place than the moon ever was. And we saw images like this of Mars, of beautiful, preserved, ancient deltas. Deltas are a something that only forms when large rivers flow into large lakes or seas. They take hundreds of thousands of years to build up. This was smoking gun evidence for lots of water, lots of long-lived water in an environment very similar to an environment we know on Earth. So this is really what we're after here when we talk about learning about Mars's ancient history. We are primarily interested in the history of water on the planet because water is the most fundamental thing that life needs. Life really needs only three things as we know it. Water, energy, and nutrients. We know that Mars's soil has plenty of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon. We've known that for a long time since our first landers went to Mars. We know that Mars has energy. Mars orbits the same sun that our Earth does. Mars is further away from the sun than the Earth, so it gets less sunlight, but it still gets enough 
to allow life as we know it to have evolved. The big question has always been water. How much of it? What type of water was it? Was it water that was good enough to drink? Or was it maybe water that was too acidic to ever have life in it? Was it water that was as acidic as battery acid? Or was it water like we have out here in the lake at Darlington? How long was that water there? If it was only like a flash in the pan, that wouldn't have been long enough for life as we know it to have emerged. But if water was here for hundreds of millions, maybe a billion years, it could be very likely that Mars was a place where life could have emerged in very similar conditions to the Earth. So these are the big questions that we're getting at. So even though Mars looks like this today, this dusty, red, barren world with no liquid water on the surface, the laws of physics dictate that liquid water cannot exist on the surface of Mars today because the surface pressure is too low. But we know liquid water did exist on Mars many billions of years ago in its past. About three to four billion years ago, we think that Mars may have looked more like this, a much more Earth-like world with a climate, clouds, rain, snow, oceans, lakes, rivers. Mars was once a more Earth-like place, and it changed into this world. How that change happened, and when it happened, and what it meant for the possibility of life on Mars, these are the big questions. And these are the tools that I use to try and answer these questions. This is NASA's robot family portrait. These are the three rovers that NASA has sent to Mars to date. The little guy in the middle you've seen already, that's the Sojourner rover, went in the 1990s to Mars. The Spirit and Opportunity rovers were identical twins, just like the rover you see on the left. Those two rovers were built in 2003, landed on Mars in 2004, they were designed to last for 90 days on Mars. The Spirit rover lasted seven years, and the Opportunity rover is still going today 11 years later. So a spectacular success. And it was these rovers that really paved the way for the biggest, beefiest rover yet, the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity on the right. And this rover is the most sophisticated piece of scientific equipment that we have ever sent to the surface of Mars. We call it the Mars Science Laboratory because it carries an onboard science lab in the belly of the rover. The major improvement of this rover above anything that's come before is that it can take pieces of the Martian surface, rocks, soils, crush them up, feed them into the sophisticated instruments that tell us in very, very uh, explicit detail what the mineralogy of the rocks are, what the chemistry of the rocks are, and what the organic chemistry of the rocks is. That is the big question. On Mars, are there the building blocks of life, organic molecules? Are these fundamental building blocks present that could have formed the basis for a Martian life form? So the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, which went to Mars in 2004, the Opportunity rover is still going today, these rovers told us a lot about the history of water on Mars. Each of these rovers found at their landing site evidence that there had been liquid water there several hundreds of millions to billions of years ago in the past. Uh, the Spirit rover found evidence that there had been a hot spring environment at its landing site. It found rocks that had interacted with large amounts of hot water in its ancient past. The Opportunity rover found evidence that there had been a shallow lake present at its landing site. But both of these rovers found that the water that had been there, that had interacted with these rocks uh, billions of years ago, had been very, very acidic. It had been water that was about as acidic as battery acid. And so the question for the next rover was not so much, was there water on Mars? That we know. The question was, is there water that could have formed a habitable environment on Mars? Is there water that would have been good enough for drink? To drink water that life could have thrived in? So that was the big question for curiosity. Now, you don't get a good sense just from these animations of how big Curiosity is. So let me show you this image, which is me next to 
the prototype Curiosity rover that we use as a testbed rover. This rover lives in a shed at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And this rover is 10 feet tall. It weighs 2,000 pounds. From wheel to wheel, it's about six feet across. And it has an arm in the front of it that is seven feet long with a set of instruments at the end of that arm that weighs 200 pounds. It's about the size of a lawnmower. That arm is long enough that if the rover wanted to, it could make a slam dunk. And the arm is so heavy that on Earth, it cannot lift its own arm all the way up. Now on Mars, Mars is a smaller planet. The gravity is smaller, about 3 eighths of what the Earth's gravity is. On Mars, it has no problem lifting that arm up. But on Earth, it is too heavy. So this is really a Martian vehicle designed for the environment of Mars. Now let me show you what it looked like as Curiosity was landing on Mars. Because this rover was so big, four to five times bigger than any rover we had sent to Mars previously, it required a new landing system to land all 2,000 pounds of it safely on the surface. So the spacecraft took about nine months to travel between the Earth and Mars. And when it got there, it only took seven minutes to land. This is called the seven minutes of terror. Now what you see here is the spacecraft entering the top of Mars's atmosphere, the heat shield protecting it from burning up. And in a second, you'll see the parachute deploy. Now when the spacecraft enters Mars's atmosphere, it's going at about 14,000 miles an hour. The parachute is going to slow it down using atmospheric drag to about 200, mi uh, 200 miles an hour. Now there's the rover you can see underneath, the sh uh, underneath its back shell attached to the parachute. And the parachute detaches, and the rover is wearing a jet pack on its back. And that jet pack is going to fire its thrusters in order to slow the rover down from about 200 miles an hour down to about two miles an hour for a safe, soft touchdown on the surface. Now we're going to zoom in to the belly of the rover where there's a camera attached on the bottom of the rover looking straight down, taking high resolution video of the surface as it's coming down. Now this is called the sky crane. The jet pack is going to hover and lower the rover down on three cables. Going down, down, down until there's a soft touchdown on the surface. The wheels have sensors in them, so the rover knows when it's on the ground. Then those cables detach, and the jet pack flies away and crashes into the surface, hopefully far, far away from the rover. And so then there's the rover on Mars, ready to go. And this was a terrifying way to land 2,000 pounds of precious cargo on the surface of Mars. These wheels that have to drive us across the surface, take us from one place to another, are also our landing gear. If we had a harsh landing, we would not be able to drive this rover anywhere. So this was very risky. And the first time that this landing system had ever been tested on Mars. We couldn't test it here on Earth because Earth's gravity is too strong. Earth's atmosphere is too thick. We could not recreate the environment on Earth in which we needed to test this, this landing system. So this was terrifying. And couple that brand new landing system with the fact that Mars has a really strong track record of eating our spacecraft. At the time Curiosity went to Mars, there had been 14 attempts by the former Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom to land spacecraft on Mars. 14 attempts, seven of them had worked. Seven had failed. So at the time Curiosity went to Mars, there was only a 50% success rate. So it was really kind of terrifying to get our spacecraft there. And with that, I'm going to show you another video of the landing that shows the animation we just saw interspliced with real footage of the engineers at NASA as they were watching the data come back from the spacecraft landing on Mars. So you're going to see here the animation of what was happening on Mars. And then you'll see these very nervous looking engineers watching and waiting for the news that all of these steps had worked correctly. 
Okay, so they've just heard that we've entered the top of Mars' atmosphere and the spacecraft hasn't burnt up. Everyone's still looking very tense. There goes the parachute. Successful deployment. Heat shield separates. Another high five moment. But the scariest part is still to come. Parachute detachment. That's a scary moment. If those thrusters don't fire, the spacecraft crashes into the surface at 200 miles an hour. The sky crane maneuver. This was the part that had never been fully tested, brand new for Mars. Touchdown on the surface. Jetpack flies away. And we're down. <laughs> so I was in a room at JPL where the 400 person science team was jumping up and down exactly like this. I've never seen so many grown men cry in my life. It was one of the best professional moments of my life when this got to the ground. And the best part was still to come. We heard word that the spacecraft had touched down, our rover was safe on the surface, and then we got the first picture. And it's a little dark, you can't see in here, but that first picture shows the rover wheel in the lower right-hand corner of the image in contact with the surface of Mars. And all of us geologists immediately ran up to the screen and we were trying to count how many little pebbles there were and how round they were and whether they were transported there in a stream bed or whether they were impact breccia. So the science began immediately. But this was an incredible success. And it was because this worked so well that NASA was able to start making plans for its next rover going to Mars that I'll tell you about in a little bit. So where did Curiosity go? Curiosity landed in the middle of an enormous impact crater called Gale Crater. This is an ancient impact about four billion years old on Mars. And there, there are craters all over Mars, but this is a special one because in the middle there is an enormous mountain, five and a half kilometers high, that's about the, uh, about the height of Mount Rainier, um, and it is not part of the impact crater itself. Some impact craters form central peaks, small mountains in the middle, but this mountain formed by another process. All of the layers in that mountain are layered stratigraphic rocks. That means that these rocks had been infilling the entire crater, and we think that there is a large portion of Mars's geologic history recorded in the layers of this mountain. If we were to take a slice through this mountain, you would see the layers of rocks filling the mountain, and then you would also see that from the rim of the crater, there have been rivers flowing down, ponding in the bottom of the crater. So Curiosity landed right down here, right next to the bottom of this mountain, about 10 kilometers away from the mountain, and so it's taken us about two years to drive to the base of that mountain. And over the next couple of years, we'll be driving up that mountain, exploring each individual layer of rock. Now I want to show you what it looked like to Curiosity as it was landing here in Gale Crater. This is the camera that you saw in the animation that was on the belly of the rover. This is what the rover actually saw, that high resolution uh, digital video that the rover recorded. What you saw in the beginning was the heat shield falling away from the rover. And now what you see, this gentle swaying back and forth of the surface, that is the rover swaying back and forth as it's landing on its parachute. This dark stuff that you see down at the bottom here, this is a sea of sand dunes. And the rest of the orangish reddish surface is just the dusty rocks of Mars. Now as we get close to landing, you'll see the ground come right up to us. By this point, the rockets, uh, the, the thrusters on that jet pack have fired. The ground is not swaying as much. It's going to come right up to us, and in a second, you'll see the front right wheel pop out.
There's the wheel. And there we are, touchdown on the surface. Now these are some of the first images taken by the cameras at the very top of the rover. The mass cam images, the two color images that give us these beautiful panoramic views of Mars. So you can see we landed in a nice flat area, a safe place to land, but zooming out, there's that five and a half kilometer high mountain off in the distance. And here's the first rover selfie. This is the rover reaching out with a microscopic imager on the end of its arm and taking its first picture of itself. It hasn't even taken its dust cover off yet, so we get a nice sepia tone glow. Now the rover landed in a flat spot that looked kind of boring, but to us geologists, the first pictures of that landing site were spectacular. This is one of the first pictures taken from the ground on Curiosity. And what we immediately saw was that these rocks look kind of like busted up slabs of concrete. These rocks are a conglomerate. That means they're made up of many, many smaller fragments of rocks. And these pebbles that are in these rock conglomerates are very small and very round. Rocks only become round when they have tumbled for a long time. And on Mars, the winds are not strong enough to blow rocks around on the surface. The only way for rocks to tumble over each other and get nice and round is if they have been flowing in a river. This was definitive evidence that there was a stream bed here on Mars at some point in the past. And as Curiosity kept driving, we saw that there was a little uh, depression in the distance. So we drove over there to get a good look, and we saw that there were more rocks with these thin layers made of small round grains of sand that looked like they had been transported in an ancient river. And when we got down to the bottom, the rocks looked very different than any rocks we had seen on Mars before. They were very, very fine grain, very flat and smooth, and they had these patterns in them that looked like mud cracks uh, that you see forming in puddles here on Earth. And so when Curiosity reached out its arm to drill into one of these interesting looking rocks, we saw that there was something very different and interesting about them. This was the first drill hole that Curiosity drilled. This uh, looks like a large hole, but it's really only about a centimeter and a half across. Very, very small. But what the drill hole gives us is a glimpse into the interior of the rock. Everything on Mars looks red. It's the red planet. And that's not because all rocks on Mars are red. It's because everything on Mars is covered with a reddish, oxidized, iron-rich dust. And that red dust makes it really hard for us to tell what the rocks are actually made of. You have to go inside the rock to get beyond that dusty covering to see what the rock really is, what the history of the rock really is. Drilling into that rock creates all of these, we call them drill tailings. It's the crushed up bits of rock that come out of the drill hole. And you can see here that they are not red like the rest of the surface of the rock. This drill hole, the inside of the rock, is this grayish blue color. Now at the time, this was the first image we had ever seen of a grayish blue rock on Mars. That's a big deal because what it tells us is that the iron that's in this rock was not oxidized, was not rusty like that red dust on the surface. What this told us was that the rock formed in much different environments than the rocks on Mars do today. This was an ancient rock. And what the data showed us um, in terms of the chemistry was that there was an organic molecule signature in this rock. And what this graph shows you is our organic um, detections in a bunch of different rocks that we've drilled on Mars. And it was only in this one, by curiosity, where we found an elevated spike due to, uh, due to an organic molecule. And this is one of the primary building blocks for life as we know it. So a very exciting thing to find in an ancient rock on Mars. We also found that there were clay minerals in this rock. Clay minerals called phyllosilicates are rocks that only form in lots of water. And they have to form in neutral waters as opposed to acidic waters. They have to form in waters that were in environments that were much more favorable to life. Quiet environments, neutral environments, and we found that there was about 30% by weight clay minerals in this rock. And so this was our interpretation. 
Even though this site on Mars was entirely dry and barren today, in its past, we think that this site on Mars was something like a mudflat in an ancient lake, a lake that would have been around for a long time, and this was our first definitive detection of an environment on Mars that not only had lots of water, but had the kind of water we know life can thrive in. This was our first detection of a habitable ancient environment on Mars. And here's Curiosity looking proud of herself. This was the first full rover selfie taken at the drill site. You can see a teeny little hole right there on the ground. That was the hole where Curiosity drilled into this rock. Curiosity has a beautiful color imager at the end of its arm, and it takes about 80 individual images to stitch together and to get a full view like this. Now I want to give you a little teaser of what's to come. Curiosity has not reached this mountain yet. That's its ultimate goal, this five and a half kilometer high stack of layered rocks. But it's on its way, and it has about a couple more kilometers to go to get there. And in the next year or two, we should be arriving here. This is one of the images of the base of the mountain, and we can start to tease out differences in the layers of the rocks and see how they change as we move up. We think that the rocks at the bottom of the mountain formed as old as 3.8 billion years ago. Really, really old rocks at the bottom of the mountain. And as we drive up the mountain, we expect the rocks to be getting younger and younger and younger. So we will be driving through Mars's geologic past, fast forwarding through time from the very beginning when Mars was warm and wet up to a point when Mars is dry and barren like it is today. We think that there are a lot of secrets to Mars's past and Mars's past global climate change locked in these rocks, so stay tuned. But here's a couple images of the foothills at the bottom of that mountain. And soon we will be right up here at the bottom of these foothills. And these images really don't give you a sense of scale. So let me show you in the middle of this white circle, there's a teeny, teeny dot that you in the back have no chance of even seeing. But this teeny little speck of a dot is the size of the Curiosity rover. So imagine when Curiosity is there, 10 feet tall, looking up at these beautiful hills towering around it. We are going to get some of the most spectacular pictures ever taken on any planet. Now this is a very special image that I want to show because it was taken yesterday on Mars. This is an image that Curiosity took yesterday, was downlinked to Earth last night, and only a handful of people have ever seen this. You can see the rover's wheel track going way back here. That's where we had driven the day before. And you can see the wheel. It's a little dark down here. I'm going to show you another picture that was taken yesterday of Curiosity's wheels. And we take pictures of the wheels periodically to make sure that they aren't getting a bunch of holes in them. Uh, you can see that there already are some holes in here from driving across rough terrain. Uh, but this isn't going to slow us down or keep us go from going anywhere we want to go. So these pictures um, are really spectacular. And they come down just about every day from Mars. And I do not get to see these any sooner than you do. I bet a lot of you were impressed when I showed you that picture and told you it was taken on Mars yesterday. But you really shouldn't be, because all of these images are available online immediately after they come down from Mars. I don't get to see them any sooner than you do. And so I'm going to encourage you, if you're interested in the Mars rovers and exploration at all, to follow along. Because this rover is not owned by scientists. Um, we don't get special access to these beautiful pictures that are coming down. This is really your rover. Follow along. All of the data are available online almost immediately. You can go to NASA's website. This is mars.jpl.nasa.gov. And you can see all of the cameras on the Curiosity rover. There are 17 cameras. And every single image taken by Curiosity is made available online on this site. Most of them are available immediately after they're downlinked from Mars. This is my favorite site that just takes all of those images from the NASA website and puts them into a little graphical thumbnail view so you can go through and quickly scan through all the new images that come from Mars. Uh, I have a great iPhone app that allows me to flip through each new image from Mars called Mars Rover Images with my morning coffee. You can also go to the New York Times website. They have a great tool called the Curiosity Rover Tracker. This shows you where Curiosity is. I grabbed this off the website yesterday. The blue line at the end shows where Curiosity drove yesterday. 
and each little line going back shows you the full path of where the rover has been driving. So you can follow along in real time. And I'm going to put in a plug from one of my favorite organizations, the Planetary Society. This is where I go for my space news. And they have a great team of bloggers there. Emily Lakdawalla is a planetary geologist who writes in a lot of detail for as wide an audience as possible uh, summaries of what's going on on Mars and elsewhere in the solar system. So this is really by the people, for the people. Space exploration is funded by large governments and the, their taxpayers, and we give that back. We make all of this data available to you, so please follow along. This is your rover. Now let me tell you a little bit about what's coming up next. Uh, this is not the end. Curiosity still has years of exploration ahead of it, but we're, still, we're already looking forward to our next spacecraft going to Mars. The next rover that NASA is going to land on Mars is going to be a rover that will not only explore the surface, uh, do science investigations there on the surface, but it is going to be the first rover to collect rocks on Mars to eventually be brought back to Earth. And the reason why that's so important, the reason why we not only want to study Mars, but we want to bring Mars back to Earth, is because there are experiments that we cannot do on Mars. There is some scientific experiments that require instrumentation the size of a laboratory that cannot be miniaturized and put onto a rover. We need to send uh, we need to send rocks from Mars back to Earth so that we can do sophisticated experiments like scanning electron microscopy, the types of experiments that can tell us whether there are the signatures of life preserved in the rocks. Even though our rovers are doing a great job telling us a lot about the history of Mars, a lot about the geology, they are not life detection tools. That, those are the kinds of experiments that have to be done on the lab here on Earth. We also need to bring rocks here on Earth so that we can keep pace with technology. Even though the Curiosity rover is incredibly sophisticated, all of its instruments are already 10 years out of date. They were designed 10 to, 10 to 15 years ago. If we had samples here on Earth, we could run the most sophisticated experiments possible. The other reason why we really need those samples here on Earth is to establish repeatability. So you may have learned in science that an observation is really only valid if it can be repeated by multiple observers. A one-off observation is not a good data set in science. So we need those rocks here on Earth so that if we make an exciting discovery, we can test it again. We can test it with more instrumentation. We can make sure that it's not an instrumentation error or a calibration glitch. So it's really important that we get those rocks here on, here on Earth. And fortunately, nature has already done this for us for free a couple of times. Every once in a while, a giant impact hits Mars and fragments from the Martian surface, rocks, are um, spewed into space. An impact large enough can eject rocks from the Martian surface into space, and every once in a while, some of those fragments of Mars rocks land here on Earth. This is an example of a rock we found in Antarctica. This rock is called Allen Hills 84001. And this rock we know came from Mars because there are very teeny gas bubbles in the rocks. And those gases contain the fingerprint of the Martian atmosphere. Those gases were sealed into the rock as it was ejected from Mars. So we know that some of these rocks, some of these meteorites in our collections, came from Mars. And we know from scanning electron microscopy, the kinds of experiments that we can do with rocks here on Earth, that some of these have very interesting uh, structures within them. This is a scanning electron mic microscope image of the interior of that Mars me meteorite. And there's a nanostructure in there about a thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair that looks very worm-like. Some scientists have argued that this is evidence for fossilized life in this rock from Mars. Now, it's very controversial, and I believe that this structure could have been created just by normal mineral precipitation too. It doesn't require life. But it shows you how important it is to be able to do these incredibly detailed Earth laboratory experiments in order to understand rocks from Mars. Now, these meteorites that we have in our collection here on Earth, they're great. They've told us a lot about the history of Mars, but they have, 
but we don't know where on the surface of Mars they came from. We did not get to choose where they came from. We don't know where they came from, and we don't know exactly what they have experienced between the Earth and Mars as they were, or between Mars and the Earth as they were traveling through space. We know that they must have gone through extremes in temperature. They must have experienced harsh radiation out there in space, the kind of radiation that can destroy evidence for life preserved in these rocks. So it's so important that we get to Mars and return rocks in a controlled way, shielding them from radiation in space that can destroy the evidence of life that we're looking for. So why haven't we done this yet? Why haven't we just gone and brought some rocks back from Mars? The answer is it's really, really hard. And in the current budget situation, we can't go all the way to Mars, pick up rocks, and bring them all the way back to Earth in a single mission. This is going to require three separate missions. The first one will land a rover on Mars that will collect rock samples. The second will land next to that rover pick up those rock samples, store them in a fancy space bucket, and launch that bucket into orbit around Mars. Now, we can only bring enough fuel to Mars to launch something into orbit around Mars. We can't send it all the way back to Earth in one go. So here's where the third stage comes in. The third step of this process is another spacecraft that will rendezvous with that sample bucket in orbit around Mars grab it, slingshot around the planet Mars, and bring it all the way back to Earth, hopefully with a safe landing. Every step of this process is really hard, and our previous sample return missions have not landed so softly on Earth. This is our sample return from the Genesis mission. And so every step of this process is difficult. And the good news, however, is that the first stage has been funded. And NASA is starting to cut metal to build the first stage rover that will land on Mars, select the most important rocks to eventually be brought back to Earth. So the big question right now is not um, when this is going to happen. We have a plan in hand. This rover is going to Mars in the year 2020, and I'm part of the team that is designing and building the cameras, which will be the two eyes on the top of this rover. Um, the big question right now, as we're developing this, is where to send it on the planet. Mars is a big place. It has as much land area as the Earth. If you imagine a globe of the Earth, and you take away all of the oceans and you squish the continents together into one globe, you would have a planet the size of Mars. Mars has just as much surface area to explore as we have here on Earth. So if you get one shot to go to Mars, collect about 20 rocks, and bring them back to Earth, where would you go? Imagine it the other way around. Imagine you're a Martian an alien on Mars, and you want to go to Earth and learn as much as you can about the entire history of the Earth and the entire history of life on Earth, but you can only go one place, drive about six miles, and pick up 20 rocks. Where would you go on the Earth to do that? You might say the Grand Canyon, because there's a big stack of rocks from all different ages, but then I would tell you that the engineers say we can't land in a canyon. It's too windy at the bottom, it's too precarious at the top. We are restricted by engineering, and we have to find the best place on the surface that's going to tell us as much as possible. So this is a process that's starting to get warmed up right now, this process of deciding where to go. And by the year 2017, NASA will have decided one spot on Mars. Right now, there are 37 candidates, and the scientific community is going to have our first debate to narrow these 37 places on Mars down to eight in August. A year from now, we'll be narrowing down that eight down to four. And then in two years, we will have one candidate landing site. So this is something that I'm starting to work on with my students at Western Washington University, starting to do some detailed scientific investigations of these sites on Mars so that we can make recommendations to NASA about which one might be the best place to go and collect our rocks from. So a couple places we'll be looking into. Marth Vallis is a spot on Mars where some of the oldest rocks on Mars are found. We're also looking into the Eberswalde crater delta. This is the most spectacularly preserved delta feature on another planet. This is a place where there had once been an ancient lake, lots of water. This might be the best place to find evidence for um, ancient fossil life if it's there. Or maybe we'll go back to the Spirit Rover's landing site. 
Uh, Spirit found evidence for a hot spring environment, lots of water, lots of energy, the kinds of conditions under which we think life emerged here on Earth. We could go back to this site, and we could even dust off the Spirit rover and take a look at it. Imagine the selfie that these two rovers could take together. So this is what's coming next, and this sample return mission is also going to pave the way for human missions to Mars, because I think our first astronauts who go to Mars are going to want to be able to come back as well, so we're going to need to demonstrate that that technology works. So when I was in high school, I was interested in many, many things. Um, science was one of my interests, but I may have well gone on to become a writer, or I, I, didn't, I wasn't one of those kids who had uh, a chemistry set and a telescope from the age of four. I was very much a liberal arts student, interested in many things, and I went to Wellesley College um, near Boston because I wanted a liberal arts education that would give me as many options to choose from. I knew that I had an interest in astronomy, so I wanted to make sure I went to a liberal arts school that had telescopes that students could use in case that was the path I wanted to go down. And so I got to Wellesley, and I thought about doing many things. There was a period when I wanted to be a women's studies major. There was a period when I wanted to be an environmental science major. And then I finally settled on physics and then astrophysics. And I, I wound up getting to use those telescopes in the end. Um, and when I was deciding which subfield of the sciences to go for, I kept getting the same advice again and again, which was, if you major in physics, that is really the foundation upon which many of the sciences, if not all of the sciences, are built. And that will be the discipline in the sciences that you could go off into any direction you wanted to. Um, it's very common for graduate students in geology or biology to have had a physics major. It's very uncommon for majors in biology to go and do graduate programs in physics. So again, I majored in physics in part to give myself the most options possible. Um, and then I started learning about Mars and decided that that was really the place to be. So I went to graduate school at Cornell University, which was where the Spirit and Opportunity rovers were being operated from. And that gave me an opportunity to get some hands-on experience with an active spacecraft mission. And I got hooked on that. So when the Curiosity rover was about to land, um, soon after I graduated uh, with my PhD, I went out to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California to work on the Curiosity mission. And that was a tremendous experience. When a rover lands on Mars for the first few months, everybody operating that rover goes on what we call Mars time, which is living on a Martian clock. The Martian day is 24 hours and 39 minutes long. That's just different enough from an Earth day to be really annoying. And what it means that is that every day starts 40 minutes later. And so day one started at midnight, day two started at 12.40 a.m., day three, 1.20 a.m., cycling around the clock. But that was a really cool experience to be living on a Martian schedule with a bunch of scientists telling a brand new rover on Mars what to do. Um, but I knew that I didn't want to just be at NASA my whole career. I wanted to be working with students. I wanted to be teaching students. I wanted to be sharing what we do with these Mars rovers just, just beyond the halls of NASA. So just last fall, um, I took a position at Western Washington University where I can continue working with the NASA programs, but I can also develop new classes about planetary, planetary geology and space exploration and be working with students in the classroom, but still be telling robots on Mars what to do. It's a great balance. What is the temperature on Mars? Very, very cold. So on average, Mars's temperatures are about minus 100, minus 170, really cold. And that's in part because Mars is very far away from the sun. It's about um, an extra, uh, it's about one and a half times further away from the sun than the Earth is. And also Mars's atmosphere is very, very thin. And so we, there is no real greenhouse warming on Mars. So a very, very cold place. And I think the highest temperature our rovers has ever recorded is about 20 degrees C, so just um, kind of like uh, what it is on outside right now would be hotter than it's ever been on Mars that we've seen. So a very, very cold place. A lot of our energy for our rovers just goes into keeping those instruments warm enough to function. So the organic molecule that I showed was chlorobenzene. The chloro comes from chlorine, 
And we don't think that the actual organic molecules on Mars had, were chlorobenzene. We know that there is another product in the Martian soil called perchlorate. And perchlorate is something that reacts with the organic molecules during our heating experiments that we use uh, an evolved gas analysis in order to detect these organic molecules. So we think that the chlorine comes separately from other species in the Martian soil. And chlorobenzene, if we were to find that here on Earth, we might not attribute it to life forms. And again, I want to emphasize that curiosity is a life-finding mission. These organic molecules that we're looking for, we don't um, know or even expect that they have been formed by biological processes on Mars. Where we are at the point where we're just looking for the fundamental building blocks of life. Are they there at all? And we know that organic molecules are abundant in the solar system. We've detected them in asteroids and in comets. And we know that those have been impacting Mars over time. So we should expect there to be some non-biologic uh, organic molecules on Mars. And this was the first time we've definitively detected them on the surface. So how is artificial intelligence going to play into a mission like this? Well, the smarter our rovers get, uh, the more science we can do and the better science we can do. And so our rovers are getting smarter and smarter. They're getting more and more autonomous, able to do more and more on their own. Curiosity now, we can tell it uh, to drive um, to that point over there on the horizon. And it is smart enough to know how to navigate itself through all of the big boulders and rocks on its way. And so we are already at the point where we can do some uh, automa uh, autonomous driving with our rovers. The really hard thing is teaching a rover to do science. And that is where we think we still need humans on the ground. And we may get to a point where we have artificial intelligence where a rover can know which rock is more scientifically interesting than another. But I think we're a long way off from that. And I think it's more realistic that we are going to have humans and robots working together on the surface of Mars, where the rovers can do a lot of the monotonous tasks, they can do a lot of the data collection, and it's still going to take the human eye and the human mind to make those decisions about which rocks are most important to study. What's the fuel source for Curiosity? So the Spirit and Opportunity rovers that came before, those were solar powered rovers. The black, what looked like wings of those rovers were solar panels. And those uh, solar panels were a great way to get fuel for Mars. Um, it comes cheap, it's free, but Mars is a very dusty place and those solar panels, when they get dusty, we don't get as much solar pow power. And the Spirit rover actually died in the end because its solar panels got too dusty and it was tilted away from the sun and it didn't get enough power even to wake up one morning. So that's how the Spirit rover died. Curiosity has a nuclear power source. It's powered by a pellet of a radioactive element, plutonium-238. And that element decays, and the heat from that radioactive decay is what we convert into energy to drive our rover. Um, it's, um, it's a much more uh, secure power source because it doesn't depend on the sun being up. It's a power source that will last for about 80 years. So um, we are really grateful for this power source, but it still gives us uh, just a minimum amount of power day to day. We operate on about 100 watts. So that means that we still spend a lot of time napping to charge our batteries. So what happens if our rovers die? Are they going to affect the environment, maybe contaminate the environment? So NASA is very careful to sterilize every piece of spacecraft that we send out there in space because we want to make sure that if we send a rover to Mars that there, hasn't, there aren't bacteria hitchhiking on that spacecraft from Earth to Mars. We don't want to contaminate Mars because what if we go to Mars and we find evidence for life and it looks eerily similar to life on Earth? How would we know that that was genuine Mars life and not Earth life that had been the result of an engineer sneezing on a spacecraft 20 years ago? So NASA is very, very careful to sterilize our spacecraft. Um, not every space agency has been that thorough, and we really don't know what the Soviets did with their spacecraft, the ones that crashed on Mars. Um, and so it is possible that Mars already has been contaminated to some extent. But we do, have, um, we do have these measures in place to sterilize every new piece of spacecraft that's going to Mars. And that's something we're going to have to think about very carefully before we send humans to Mars, is not just the contamination of 
uh, any possible Mars life getting into a human system, but we want to make sure that humans do not contaminate Mars. We want to treat it like a very special national park. The rovers that are on Mars that have died, we really can't do anything for them because we don't have any way to bring them back, we don't have any way to repair them, so they are just there dead. And one day the spirit rover, I like to think, will have a velvet rope around it in the Smithsonian Museum on Mars. But until then, they're just sitting there. So there have been now 15 attempts to land on Mars, eight have worked, and all 15, whether they're in whole pieces or many, many pieces scattered around a crash landing site, they're all still on Mars. We have never brought anything that we sent to Mars back. And that's why this next rover that's going to go collect rocks to bring back to Earth is such a big advancement, um, that this is going to be the first step towards actually returning something back from Mars. There has been a private organization that's proposed sending humans to Mars on a one-way trip, and they've had thousands of volunteers to go on a one-way trip to Mars. Um, I, don't think that, uh, I don't think that NASA would ever send a one-way trip to Mars, and I think that uh, it's unlikely that this private organization will get humans to Mars on a one-way trip as well, because no one, no one wants to watch their fellow man die on another planet. I think that um, it's, going to take, uh, it's going to take another 20 years or so for us, for NASA to be at the point where we can send humans on a round-trip journey, but I, I'm optimistic that it'll happen within my lifetime. And I think these private organizations are going to be playing a larger and larger part as time goes on. For these big missions of exploration, though, I think these are going to require things like our sample return missions to Mars, sending the first humans to Mars. Those are so big and ambitious that I think they're going to require the effort of a government agency and, and realistically, multiple governments collaborating together. So our Curiosity rover, we have instruments that were built on this rover from the Russian Space Agency, from the European Space Agency, uh, from the Canadian Space Agency. So our rovers are already in this pattern of being multinational collaborations. And I think that's how our big exploration projects are going to continue into the future. I was talking with the class of 53 about this idea of the one-way trip to Mars and who are these crazy people who would sign up for that one-way journey. And I was saying that I think that that drive to go out and explore and seek something new, even if we never come back, I think that is deeply ingrained into our DNA as a species. Um, it is this drive to explore that has defined humans. Um, and it was the same drive that compelled the Polynesian people to get into their long boats and paddle out to the horizon and find the Hawaiian Islands. It was that same drive that compelled our European ancestors to sail uh, across the Atlantic, not knowing what they would find, not knowing that there were these new worlds here. And that same drive for exploration, I think, is what compels these people who may seem crazy to sign up for a one-way journey to Mars. It's really that drive that separates us from every other species that exists on this planet. And it may seem crazy, but hey, we've won. We dominate the Earth, right? We, it's worked out well for us. And again, thank you, Darlington. Thank you, Class of 53, for inviting me here to speak.